meant to be here. And we're going to get started even one minute late. That's great. Uh, and I'm going to say to get started, I'm freaked out, number one, because thanks to COVID, this is the second time I've talked in front of a group of people in the last four and a half years, so that's good. And number two, I have no podium to hide behind, which really freaks me out. Uh, so, hooray. But that'll be fine. Uh, this is you know, manage yourself first. I'll give you a quick overview of who I am, how we got here. Uh, I think it's really interesting, too, to follow up what Amy June was talking about. I'm going to hit some of the same topics that she hit, but probably in a very different way. So, anyway, I am Ken Rickard. I'm the Senior Director of Consulting at Palantir.net. For those of you in the D.C. area, that's Palantir.net. We're a web development consultancy out of Chicago. We're not that other group of people. I'm aging record across all things. Um, we do actually own the app college here, which is good. Uh, agenda. We're going to talk about management, which is a little bit interesting because we went to a flat organization after I wrote this uh, originally in 2019. So I no longer manage people. However, um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in terms of management also applies in terms of interpersonal communications and collaboration. So I think that's really, really interesting. So we're going to talk briefly about what managers do. We're going to talk about the value of emotional intelligence. We're going to talk about overcoming implicit bias, which becomes really a fraught topic for someone like me to present. I, I think it's very interesting that I end up talking about what are essentially diversity and inclusion issues, and I will be very straightforward that I do so because I can get away with it, right? Because I've been in the Drupal community since 2005, um, I was in the room when they demoed views for the first time. Mm. There were 12 of us. <laughs> right? Um, and so I don't do technical talks anymore. I do talks like this now. I did a whole thing on emotional labor um, at a Drupal con once. Because people need to be talking about it, and they need to be able to do it from a place of security that's not going to damage them professionally, which is a really interesting thing we probably won't get into. But I think I should ground here. Um, I also want to talk about ground rules for just a second. Uh, we do a lot of storytelling like Amy June did, and, and I love this slide. Um, I went, I had a sabbatical. We have sabbaticals at Palantir. Every seven years, you get to take a month. On my sabbatical, we went to Australia. We spent three days in the outback. We went to Uluru, uh, which is the native name for what some people know still as Ayers Rock. And we went on a tour. This is a modern version of sand painting by the originals. And we have several of them in my house. We love them. Um, and I, I use this as a prompt because um, we had an Aboriginal tour company take us around Uluru, but not an Aboriginal tour guide. It was an Anglo tour guide. And it was fascinating because he'd tell us stories about this plant and this rock and this tree. And every once in a while he'd stop and he'd say, well, there's a story here, but it's not my story to tell you. And then he'd move on. So whenever I do sessions like this, I want to be really, really clear. We can only speak for ourselves, and it's not my job to tell stories about other people. Right? I cannot try to interpret what other people do or feel or say. So I'm not going to. And I, I really urge you to adopt this. Uh, we did a really intense session at a talk company meeting, and I ended up leading a circle discussion on these issues. And this was our ground rule. This was our only ground rule, in fact. Um, and it, it worked out really well. So let's just start talking about leadership. I'm going to make a broad statement. That unless you have an MBA, you probably did not study to become a manager and did not expect to be one. How many of you, by the way, are managers? OK, there we go. The first time I gave a talk like this, there were like six people in the room. And oh, how many of you are developers? How many of you are developers and managers? Okay. The first time I did this the version of this talk, we had like half developers, half managers, and nobody who was both. <laughs> right? Um, unless you really studied for, for management, 80% uh, leadership is literally just showing up. The volunteers at this event can prove that to you. Right? They show up, they give you something to do, or if nobody else does it, you step up and you take it on. Um, and then I'll say the other person. 20% is actually caring about what happens. Um, the other thing that I will ground here is that we're going to make big mistakes. I'm going to talk about some of my big mistakes. 
real, real fun. Uh, but how you handle those mistakes really is going to define success. Uh, and I went through, I gave this talk five years ago, and I went through and edited it. And one thing I said is I changed all the I and B to our and we. But I, I want to include people in this. Uh, quick overview of how I got here. Um, we talk about advantage, we talk about privilege, I'm going to talk about opportunities later. Um, I got into this business in 1998, when you could get an internet job with no experience, because no one had any experience. <laughs> right? um, this, this sort of pale box around these things is my Drupal time. Like I said, I got into Drupal in 2004 because a manager of mine asked me to look at open source technology solutions. Oh, but you can see really interesting development. I even did sales for a while, which was really, really hot. Um, but at one point at Palantir, we had 25 employees, if you count the two CEOs, and 21 of them directly reported to me. That was here. That's in about 2008, not 2008 2013 to 2015. Uh, and that was a little overwhelming, by the way. 20, 21 people is too many people to try to manage. Uh, so let's talk about opportunities. I, I deliberately, and it's funny because one of my coworkers is in the front row. We had a conversation about this the other day. I deliberately did not use privilege. I really want to stay away from that discussion because it's fraught. So I'll just talk about opportunities. Um, I grew up with economic security, middle class family. Hey, uh, when I actually jumped into the internet business, I had two jobs to choose from, and I chose the one closer to my parents in case everything went belly up, and I had to move back, because I couldn't have. Um, I had multiple college degrees, as I mentioned, I got in in 98, before CSS. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> before CSS. Um, and I had support, and I had some early success. Uh, I think that's really important too. Um, Amy June said this too, find trusted mentors. The first big challenge I had in my business career, again, I got hired in to run a department of two people in the nascent online division of a newspaper uh, in Conway, Arkansas, my wife's hometown. And like the third thing I was asked to do was write a budget for the year. How many of you have budget responsibilities? These are fun. I have never written a budget before in my life. I had no idea what I was supposed to do. Lucky for me, I went to the controller, the guy who was in charge of such things, and he agreed to sit me down and walk me through it. Saved my life. Saved my job. So, that's a big deal. Um, I did not raise my hand. I do not have imposter syndrome, because I've been doing this for a very long time. Dory, I thought Dory laughed, because Dory's known me for a while. Um, but I, these are things I did not know when I, when I started. I didn't know anything other than HTML. Uh, I didn't know how to use uh, like control X, control V, <laughs> and I was doing that with a mouse. And my coworker sitting next to me was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and then he showed me the shortcut. Uh, I didn't know journalism, but I was working in the newsroom. I didn't have a budget. I didn't know how to manage. Uh, I tried to fire someone once in our morning stand-up. We used to do a morning stand-up, and, and and the publisher would be like, "Hey, what are you doing today?" I'm like, "I'm going to go fire Jess." And he's like. Can't do that. <laughs> what do you mean I can't do that? She's she's no good. She's not good at her job. And he's like, we have a system. I'm like, oh. Uh, so that was that was fun. Um, and I think Amy June touched on this too. There's a leadership something, right? That success does feed success. You take on challenges. You do what people think you can, which is a, a big one. You admit what you don't know, and you get help from experts. Right. Uh, the thing that made my career in the newspaper business was I was sitting, after a year, I was sitting in a strategic planning meeting with the senior VP of the entire region who was in charge of like 15 newspapers. And we were talking about budgets and revenue growth. And it comes to my turn and I'm like, what do you want me to do for the next year? And, and I like turned to the general manager for help. And I turned to the publisher for help. And they both defer to the VP. And the VP goes, no, you tell me. Now, he's totally expecting to never hear from me again. And two weeks later, he's got a 30-page report on his desk that's like, well, here's what we're going to do. I still have a copy of that line around somewhere. Um, 
This brings me to my first great quote. Um, we are who we pretend to be. Great fun. I did a thesis on Kurt Vonnegut long ago. Um, we are who we pretend to be. So you can get pretty far through your imposter syndrome just by walking the walk, by talking the talk. Again, being genuine and honest about the things you do know and you don't know. And I will also say from a career spread standpoint, if you're in a place where people won't help you, get out and get out fast. Right. Again, easy for me to say. Um, sorry. Whoa. That was interesting. All right. Yeah, what, yeah, what are technical leaders asked to do? Because I assume that those of you who are managers are technical managers. You manage technical teams. Um, sorry. Yeah, guide teams to successful outcomes. Right. Generally, that's budget, scope, schedule. Right. But it can be more than that. And I think that's important to note um, because it's both short term and long term. And short term is typically budget, scope, schedule, and long term is more about developing the potential of those individuals so they can do your job so you don't have to anymore. Right? I made a very long career about making myself replaceable so I could go on and do something else or something more interesting. Uh, it's a really good model, I think. Advocate for it if you can get away with it. But it means, again, caring about the people you're working with and finding opportunities for them to excel. I mean, the great flip is when you get to start mentoring other people. And the other great flip, and this happened to me recently, we had a new hire who came on, and there was a point, and I was her mentor, and there was a point when we were in a meeting, and we were arguing in front of other people, and I went, oh yeah, you're right, you do what you said, do that. And after she's on Slack, and she's like, what just happened? Like, you were right, I was wrong, and that's great. Um, totally blew her mind. <laughs> so, but that's actually a, a bedrock foundation for her going forward, right? Where I've been at the company for 15 years, and, and she's been there for nine months, right? And I'm deferring publicly to her judgment. That's a huge win, right? So, yeah. These are some of the things that managers do. Right? We lead projects, we assign work, we review. We mentor, evaluate, and promote. This is really a fraught area we're going to get into. Uh, we also, again, support, motivate, and discipline. These two in particular are really, really fascinating. Promotion and discipline. And, and when I say discipline, I mean like punish. By like literally being like people up. Uh, negatively affect their career advancement. That's a great way of it. Uh, here's the challenge. When do these things happen? Right? Uh, here's my calendar. Here's my schedule. Uh, and for those of you who are in government, when I say sales pitch, just think um, RFP review. Right? So if you don't have to sell things necessarily. But you Right, you're reviewing other people's responses. So I actually looked at my calendar one day. On Monday, I don't manage people, but on Monday I had eight meetings that lasted six hours. Hooray. <laughs> so this is this is my schedule. You'll notice you're tucked at the end of the day, I have an annual review of one of my direct reports. Um, however, if these things don't happen the way you expect them to, uh, the sales pitch ran long and our client check on check and exploded because the client's angry with us, right? So my schedule got blown. And this is where we're going to get. I'm spending time triaging with the project manager about how to salvage this thing and how to assuage wounded egos and hard feelings and things like that. And the question that I would ask you, uh, one thing I would say before I get to the question, you know, context, context switching is very difficult. Uh, you have to be prepared for this stuff. I think, there is my question. <laughs> Am I likely to bring my best self to the performance review? Uh, and I'll say for the people who were in the room early, did you see what happened when I came in the room and couldn't get the thing to work? And noticed there was no blank term for me to hide behind? <laughs> and I kind of freaked out a little bit. So this is the, the real challenge, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, and this is where the fun starts. Uh, I have anger management issues that I have worked very, very hard on. 
there's good news to this. The good news is I don't generally get angry at people. I get angry at stuff. Yeah, I hooked a Wi-Fi just so the GIF would go. <laughs> just so the GIF would go. I have two GIFs, and that's one of them. Um, yeah, so some real-world examples. These are things that actually happen to me. Um, I probably going to respect my opinion because I'm a woman. To my credit, I took this to the client and said, hey, what's going on here? And they handled it internally. And I was able to go back to that person and say, here's what's going to happen. And things did, in fact, improve. But I wasn't expecting this. I don't have a whole lot of experience with this behavior. Right? Um, I tend to draw, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, pretty much automatic respect when I'm in these kind of situations because I've been doing these things for a long time and I talk the talk and I walk the walk and I look the part, right? <laughs> the story I was going to tell, I can't, it's not my story, <laughs> so I'm going to skip it. Uh, the client asks us to start working nights and weekends to hit deadlines. We don't do this at Talent here, this is a big deal. Uh, we actually have a, a state government client right now that wants us to do a deployment this Sunday morning. And someone agreed to do it, but that's very unusual for us. Uh, uh, I was harassed last weekend. This is actually the same person who complained about the client. Uh, I was harassed last weekend. Meet up and nothing was done. This was a really tough one for me because that happened in Chicago and I live in Georgia and work remotely. This one did not get handled well. I'll be honest. Uh, yeah. How many of these scenarios have we actually prepped for? Probably had some minor sexual harassment training. I had to take a course every year. That's about it. Uh, so, another thing that I mentioned before that most people don't train to become managers. You just sort of fall into it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I did not sign up for it. This thing. <laughs> this is quote number. Sorry. Quote number two. This is from my mother. <laughs> <laughs> it is very possible that I am somewhere on the autism spectrum. Um, I've never been diagnosed, but it's very, very likely. Um, I don't pick up people's emotional state real well. I did teach for a long time, so I'm good at noting when people don't understand what I'm saying and changing tactics. But I'm not real good at figuring out people are upset. Um, so. <laughs> Often I don't care. <laughs> I don't want to care. Right? If I can get away with not caring. However, you, you have to. You have to care. So this is the big challenge. So we must be, pre be prepared to react to the unexpected in a productive and collaborative way. And the question that I have, and I'm going to keep track on time. I got until 11, you say? Mm -hmm. oh, I got 25 minutes. I can do this. Uh, step number one, each interaction is a chance to build or harm a trust relationship. Alright, this is again, a story I really want to tell that I can't. Uh, but it's a big deal. And I'm going to show you a tool that worked really well for me. This is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Right? Most people are familiar with this. I use it just as a grounding. Because what Maslow says in the psychological theory is if you don't have these basic things, you can't do these more complicated things. Right? And I said I did a lot of work on, on my anger management. Um, the same thing can be applied to emotional responses to things or physiological responses to things, where your, your base reactions, what one author I read called the lizard brain, right? fight or flight, like, you know, I've been accused of mismanaging something, or doing something wrong, or whatever, leading to a bad outcome. Do I get mad about it? Um, do I like retrench and double down and accuse them, the person accusing me of stuff? Do I do I turtle? Do I? Uh, so, yeah, fight, flight, retreat, retreat, response, reaction. It's, it's up here, these top two, engagement and ethical actions, actually where we want to be. And so one of the, let's make sure I have my slides in the right order. I do. Uh, the, the book I have a list of readings at the end I'll give you, uh, calls this amygdala hijack. It's a fancy term that means your lizard brain is taking over and you should keep your mouth shut and not say anything. Right. Uh, there's a great example in the book 
It's called Just Listen by Mark Golston. It's a great example of the book where Colin Powell, this is not my story, I know, but I'll tell it anyway. Colin Powell, Secretary of Defense at the time, is giving a, 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 a briefing, and like somebody asks him about, I don't know, like his impending divorce or something. <laughs> Wholly inappropriate, totally off topic. And he, he literally takes like a half step back from the lectern, takes a deep breath, comes back and says, next question. <laughs> right? Because he knows he's not in the right mental state to respond to this. Right? So this is actually step one of how do you deal with things you're not expecting to deal with? Well, you make sure you're in control. Yeah, how did I react to the fact that I couldn't get the laptop to work? I didn't wait for Dory. I went and found somebody to help me fix it so I could get back into control and try to engage properly. I, that's really, really important. So, <laughs> Golson calls this go from oh shit to okay. Um, and his point is you always want to be moving up this stack. And so, for people like me who have difficulty recognizing emotions, even their own emotions, I have said for a long time, my, my armchair psychology opinion, uh, men are incapable of holding two emotions at one time. That's actually not true. Men can do it. I can't. And the problem is when I have two emotions at one time, let's say embarrassment and shame, they're very close. Uh, if I have two emotions at the same time, I go to the easier emotion, which is anger. It happens. Right, uh, but being able to know that, and that's the sort of retreat, res retrench response. It's not a fight or flight, I don't think. Um, so I'll go back to this question: Am I likely to bring my best self to the performance review? And if we care about the people, we can address this. So you, part of it is you got to care about yourself first. Right? Am I in the right state of mind to be giving this, this feedback? Uh, it gives me to my segue to part two. We have to be aware of whom we are inclined to care about. And this is where things could get tricky. Uh, when we talk about implicit bias, bias and limits of empathy, I had a real problem the last 10 years. Empathy got a real big push in the, in the literature. And empathy scares me a little bit because empathy often forces us to choose sides. And it can become very easy to say, well, I empathize with person A in this conflict, and therefore I don't like person B. Being empathetic with everyone is a good thing. But I'm, I'm very wary of, of empathy as a general. So I want to identify the assumptions that we bring to things. <laughs> I love this. So we're going to go a little lighter for a minute. Which is Charlie's Angels Test. This actually happened. In a scrum, we were, we were all just sort of getting loose, getting limber, asking questions, and somebody asked a Charlie's Angels questions, and some of us in the room pictured these people, because <laughs> I was born in 1969, so these are my Charlie's Angels. Uh, most of the people on the call pictured these people, and even better, since I wrote these slides, a third one came out, which my high school friend had the writing credit on, oddly enough. Yeah, so this is a really simple funny version of the, uh, excuse me, there's a fourth. Mm -hmm. Who? <laughs> <laughs> I have coworkers who didn't grow up in the United States. They have no idea who Charlie's Angels are. They, they probably do, but they don't have that same in, intimate, immediate response, right? Uh, this is a simple, safe, I'm going to say, test for what are your assumptions about things? What, what, where did you grow up? When did you grow up? What are your defaults? This is a pretty harmless case to be like, oh yeah, when you say the color blue, there's like 87 shades of blue, right? And we're all thinking of slightly different things. And, and that matters. Um, so when things go wrong, the thing that I, again, kind of spend some time on is what's your gut reactions? Whose side are you inclined to take? Um, and how do we identify and compensate for that? Right, so I'm going to do more fun stuff. I like this part. Um, I stole this right from five years ago. So, uh, 
back before the pandemic, I used to travel a lot. My wife and I would fly overseas, and on an overseas flight, I might watch like four movies and cry during three of them. So this is my my empathy test. Oh, spoilers! By the way, <laughs> these movies are old. So it's <laughs> this is the J.J. Uh, Abrams remake of Star Trek. This is uh, Chris Hemsworth who auditioned to play Kirk and didn't win it, so he got to play Kirk's dad and dies in the first ten minutes of the movie, saving the lives of eight hundred people. <laughs> And it makes me cry every single time I watch it, because it's really heroic. This is uh, Fury, an underrated uh, movie about Brad Pitt as a tank commander in World War II who has to send his squad of like three tanks to go fight off a German panzer division so that the invasion force can actually land. They're doomed from the beginning of this movie. And you know they're doomed from the beginning of this movie, and it's just a long, slow Weep fest <laughs> for some people, <laughs> and then oops, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, Toy Story three. Yeah, <laughs> I I thought it was odd too. No, you'll notice there's something uh, familiar or consistent among these three character sets. <laughs> that's not an accident. That's that's just not an accident. I empathize very naturally with these people. Oh, look, it's a white guy in a leadership position. <laughs> okay. I can recognize and I can own that. And I think that's really important. Um, oddly, another movie that did make me cry, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about, Hidden Figures, great film. And this is where I sometimes get in trouble. So, Hidden Figures, we're going to talk about <laughs> leadership model. Um, three Three really strong leadership models come out of this movie. Um, there's the Kirsten Dunst character who is doing the classic normalize and enforce, command and control, and just don't, don't do this. Just don't. Um, there's the predict and prepare. How many of you have seen this movie? I'm going to spoil it, right? Hey, computers are coming. We should probably train up on computers and be ready for them. Right? Um, this is great. This is long-term leadership strategy, building strong teams to take on future challenges. Uh, highly recommended. Um, and then set goals and remove obstacles. This Kevin Costner character is a solid model for leaders to emulate. Um, we're going to get into this in a second. I would also point out how weird it would be if the Kirsten Dunst character and the Kevin Costner character were swapped in this uh, swapped in this movie, which probably wouldn't be possible because it takes place in the 60s and having a woman lead an uh, 800 person team yeah probably but it occurred to me the other day it would be really fascinating if you swapped those two characters so here's the thing um, <laughs> leadership archetypes and all the other stuff that we consume and again films count those can reinforce bias so here's my, my big point um, Dorothy Vaughn's a real person. She actually did the things shown in the movie. Katherine Johnson, a real person. Mary Jackson's a real person. Kevin Costner, not a real person. <laughs> <laughs> He's an amalgam of several characters made to make the story more dramatic, and I will argue more appealing to me. And why would a Hollywood studio want to make a movie more appealing? A movie about three black women more appealing to white men. So they can sell more tickets because it's America, and I don't think I have to finish that sentence. Uh, this hasn't been in my head again. This never happened. <laughs> but wow, this makes me feel good. Because, <laughs> yeah, I would have done that. <laughs> this is all just, it's, it's horse shit. It is horseshit designed to make me feel good about past inequities. And to make me think that these things don't exist anymore because this fight has already happened. And I don't have to do this all the time because somebody else already did it. So that's, that's my... Well, we're in pretty good shape on time. So how, how does this bias surface? That's... <laughs> um, everyday interactions. Hiring, evaluation, promotion who you give authority to, who you give leeway to. Right. You ever run across this? Some people have a little more rope, a little more permission to go and do and try and experiment. Um, 
how you mediate conflict, how you give direction, uh, who you trust. So watch for these things in your own behavior. Um, I don't, you should probably also be alert to in other people's behavior, but I, I don't necessarily want to put that burden on you. I think from my perspective, from a management perspective, well, managers are responsible if you see this kind of thing. Like, oh, by the way, I noticed that when Heather gets in a room to mediate between Tom and Julie, he, she always takes Julie's side. That could be a problem. Good. And managers are liable for that stuff. But I'm not suggesting you necessarily examine your co-workers all the time. Let's concentrate on us first. That's, that's my, my point. So monitor reactions. Um, yeah, who delivered that news? When did they deliver it? How did they deliver it? And the big one, uh, was I prepared to receive it? Right? And it's okay to ask for permission to do things. It is also okay not to respond immediately. One of the good things, and this is likely what would happen in that fictional example where I have a performance review I'm supposed to do. I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to discuss this. Can we meet in, the, in an hour or can we reschedule? This is okay. It's perfectly fine to move things, to say, I, as long as you own it, right? have to be really open about that. We're good on top, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> did, I, did I skip a slide? No. Uh, when there are disputes about this sort of thing, my big point here, uh, you want to start from a place of agreement, even if that agreement is based on facts, and even if that agreement is that it's screwed up, it's okay in most cases to admit that you made a mistake. Um, and you want to move forward together. You want to always be you and you want to help other people be moving up that ladder of engagement. Um, identify shared goals, make a plan, work to build trust. I think I have, ooh, no. So I, I left out a story. The greatest example of this for me when I was managing 21 people, excuse me, and I'm remote. I'm one of, at the time I was one of about four remote people. And I had someone come, I was there for an onsite, for an all company. And so I was actually in the office for a week. And someone scheduled some time and came and said, hey, we just promoted Paul, who's my peer, but why didn't I get promoted too? We basically do the same thing. And my answer to that was, I don't know because we don't work closely enough together for me to actually know what your performance is like, which is a horrible thing for me to admit, but is absolutely true. And so what I was able to do, what we were able to do, was say, look, I'm going to be here for another three days. And before I leave town, we're going to have a plan for how I can get the information that I'm lacking, how you can make, make sure that you have an opportunity to show me what you want to show me and we have a six-month plan for getting this promotion in place. And we agreed to that, and that was fair. And it, again, identify the shared goal. I want to be fair. They want to get promoted. Uh, we made a plan. We built some trust that had been corroded by inaction, which is kind of fascinating, too. So the other part here, this is part two of the Vonnegut quote. Yeah. Uh, Mother Night is about a man who claims to be an American spy who is then arrested as a German war criminal. It's, it's one of his grimmer novels. Uh, we are who we pretend to be, so be very, very careful who you pretend to be. I think that's important. So I do have a, oops, a list of further reading. Um, these are books that have helped me uh, drive as a, now a modern classic. Um, seven written, seven hidden reasons why employees leave. Um, difficult conversations is a good one. Multipliers is good too. Uh, managing humans is just a lot of little stories about being an engineering manager. Uh, like a lot, a lot of time it Just listen is I, I crib from a lot in this talk. Uh, and then if you want to get heavy, 
Uh, this is like academic level philosophy, epistemic injustice. Um, Power and the Ethics of Knowing, which talks about the implicit bias of how we adjudicate the truthfulness of people. And the fact that, particularly in American society, there's a definite hierarchy of truthfulness. And guess what? Kevin Costner's at the top of that hierarchy. Uh, and that's really problematic. Uh, and I recommend Mother Night. Hey, look, I stopped with time for questions. I'm going to leave this up. Uh, I thank everybody for your time and your attention. <sighs> yeah, I missed my podium. <laughs> You're good without it. I, I appreciate that. But it's like it's like that little armor, that little that little pad between me and whatever. Let me get to pace. Well, I usually I usually pace anyway. Like I'd be I would be at the podium and I'd be like, okay, we'll go over here. Are there any questions or or things I can? Yes. So do you do any consulting work with government agencies? Because this is where there's just such a divide because this is Drupal, GovCon, and there are limitations mm -hmm. as manager to what we can do. Bargaining unit employees. You know, there's just, it really can be hard sometimes to implement or bridge the gap because there's just. Yeah, so we do technical consulting with government agencies. We do not do management consulting. Right? This is not what I do for a career. These are things that I have learned along the way to make my career better and to make the team better. Now, actually, the CEO of yeah. Palantir is in the so, back of the room. So, but, but within that, Consulting. What we can do is um, help teams within our client organizations um, shape, make a term the shape of their what their team should be, what kinds of roles you might be looking for, which you know can is sometimes something that is a, a little bit more under control and, and can help identify the, the kinds of people you want in different kinds of positions, right? Yeah. The, the the challenge that I, I think you, you hit on is something that we talked about. Uh, we have a we have a group that meets regularly at the office to talk through issues like this. Um, and it's mostly just circle sharing of hey, here's what I've been reading, here's what I've been experiencing, um, and we talked about the fact that I have my slide called opportunities, and it's not called privileges. Because I wanted to stay away from that word, because while Andy June was talking about privilege a lot, and talking about a lot of things that I think both of us who were steeped, or at least conversant in diversity and inclusion, understand to be positive code words. For many people, are oh, you said that I'm going to I'm going to stop listening, right? And so, especially in a more structured situation like government. <sighs> It can be very, very fraught to have these conversations because people will follow the letter of the law, mm -hmm. and that's it. So I don't have a good answer for that, other than speak from your experience as often as you can to the people you need to. Be. And again, it's why I do talks like this instead of talking about, hey, let's write a views plugin to connect to an Oracle database. Like, we don't care about that stuff. I mean, we do, but that's easy, right? You can learn that from YouTube for crying out loud. But I can't because I hate YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yeah. How do you empower your direct, direct reports or like those who are under direct reports? Like, if you're like a TPM or you're a portfolio level, how do you when you need to, how do you empower devs, even maybe even project managers, not to work in silos? All right, there's a lot to especially, unpack. Especially yeah. within the remote world that we in now. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, and I'll, I'll start with something that Fricker talks about, and a lot of the literature talks about. We don't like the word empower anymore, because empower implies that I can give and remove your power and authority. So. There, there's, there's number one. Do you have an alternative? Uh, Rasky matrixes. <laughs> like a racing. Ra uh, race, yeah, I, I call it Rasky because it's 
that I don't accidentally say racist, so rasky making yeah. Ra responsibility, accountability, consulting, consulting yeah. informed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the classic. Yeah, you're responsible for this. Rather, that is a way to give people authority on a project, right? Whenever I was running big complex things, I like to chunk out the big like, hey, here's a responsibility area for single sign-on across like the government sign-on thing. I just had to resurrect my social security.gov account, which required me to find a piece of paper from 15 years ago, which was great. Um, but if you can chunk it into pieces, like, hey, you have the responsibility for tracking the budget. Hey, you, and project managers typically do. Um, but for developers, as you're helping them gain stability in and trust in their own authority, that's the way I would put it. Um, it's about giving them small chunks of responsibility, things that they own, and that you be like, look, I'm kind of going to rubber stamp your decisions on this. I mean, you don't have to tell them that. But again, if we do a big project like this person's responsible for single sign-off. This person's responsible for, for you know, this database integration. This person's responsible for the theme. And I'm just responsible for making sure it all works together. That can work really well. Uh, we do a lot, again, we're now, excuse me, self-organizing in our teams. And when it works correctly, that's what we end up doing. Is we'll look at a backlog and people will say, oh, I'm interested in this thing. If we've really done it correctly, when we get in to make that team, we'll know, everyone will know what their, their learning or career objectives are, and they'll be able to say, oh, I want to take this on because it's new to me. Or, I'll handle the migration because I'm, I'm an expert at that, and I'm very confident that I can own that and get it done. So, it's about, I would say, surveying the team uh, what they're what they're confident in if you're trying to boost their confidence or where they're trying to stretch if you think they're ready for that or if they think they're ready for that not you is that a, get your question that part but also let's say you have let's say drupal 10 let's yeah. say we're migrating to drupal 10 and i need to know what what are we have syncing the databases what, what what part of this process we're in mm -hmm. i don't want to have to call you and check in with you every five seconds and what you're doing. Right. How, how do I, how, how, how do we not allow there to be gaps in time where there's days or something where they're working in this silo almost yeah. and not collaborating with their other teammates? I guess. Or, That's what Scrum is for. That's yeah. what daily stand-ups are for. It, it's funny, even before I knew what Scrum is, literally my first professional job, the publisher got all the department heads together and we have a 10 minute morning stand up where we literally had to stand up and his question was hey what what's on your agenda for today is anything on fire do you need help from anyone else that that was it and all the departments would just do it and cer certain days you would know oh i can't ask steve for this because steve is up to his eyeballs in x uh, yeah, getting people to update things in like Jira and all that's <laughs> all really fraught. <laughs> Daily 15 minute check in. That, that's the, the biggest thing that we have to train our new developers on is give us status updates. And the, the biggest thing I, I try to get across to them as a very senior developer who knows massive parts of the Drupal stack is sometimes I might find myself with two free hours where I can help you, but if your work's not in a state where I can pick it up, I can't help you, right? And so making sure that people have good habits. And we do project charters, and charters where you get everyone to buy in and agree, hey, I'm going to update ticket status every day, or I'm going to write in a written scrum log every day, right? Or I'm going to make sure, this is one of my first things, well, I don't believe in local branches for you developers out there. <laughs> if you tell me you're working in a local branch, I think you're lying to me because I've had people do it. So the first thing I always do is get branch, create, get, get push, origin, boom. And then I start coding. And then when people are like, hey, what are you working on? I'm like, oh, it's this branch over here. Is there a pull request? No, I'm still fiddling with it, but you can go look at it. Okay, now we're at time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Oh, you're all right.